Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon, everyone. Do you ever procrastinate? Have you come across a friend or family member who has a self-control problem? Hi, I am Mohammed, and I am a public policy consultant working in the area of decision making with focus on the sexier field of behavioral economics. If you have heard about nudges or behavioral insights, then the topic of my talk today is about ideas in those subjects. If you are trying to guess what field of study this is, I would say it is a combination of psychology and economics, perhaps with some philosophy as well, and with inputs from related fields such as neuroscience and neuroeconomics. Let me start by introducing the topic of my talk today. The questions that I asked earlier about procrastination and self-control problem are very relevant to my talk today. Every now and then, I know for sure that I procrastinate, and I believe some of you in the audience too. I wish I didn't procrastinate, but I did. Similarly, there were times when we could not resist on certain things. Think of uh, attending a buffet lunch before COVID, that is, where there's a high chance of overeating or splurging on delicious high sugar desserts. When the latest model of gadgets such as smartphone is out in the market, for instance, some of us could not resist from buying the gadget uh, to follow the trend of our peers, even though our existing smartphone is still working perfectly. As a student or working professional, when you receive your monthly allowance or pay, you have to determine how to spread your expenditure for the whole month, what and when to buy, bills to pay, etc., and how much to save. Assuming that your income is more than the amount required to meet an acceptable living standards, how many of you have saved consistently every month? How many of you find that at the end of the month, you barely have enough until you receive your next paycheck? All these are very relevant questions which are affecting our day-to-day -day life. It is, if it's not applicable to you, perhaps it is relevant to someone who you might know. Every day, we make tens and thousands of decisions, either consciously or unconsciously. On average, we make 35,000 decisions every day of very difficulty and importance. We make decisions on a variety of domains, ranging from the mundane daily tasks of deciding what to have for breakfast or what clothes to wear to the more sophisticated decision with the long-term implications, such as deciding what to do or which course to pursue after finishing high school. After finishing our undergraduate studies, we are faced with the daunting task of looking for a job, perhaps choosing our own place to stay to. Then, as we move to the next phase of our life, some of us choose to tie the knot and settle down. Some of these are tough decisions that we have to make, particularly in deciding who do you want to spend the rest of your life with? And of course, there's the public life, the society that we live in. We are often influenced by what other people do. We want to be accepted as part of whichever group or community uh, we choose to associate ourselves with. On top of that, there are myriad of decisions that other people make that could influence our life and vice versa. Unhealthy lifestyle and inadequate savings for retirement are some of the examples with long-term implications, not only to our life, but to other people too. Healthcare spending could increase and so are the financial aids for the elderly. As the expenditure comes from the public coffers, all members of society are affected. All these are public policy issues, such as uh, issues as a result of individual decisions or behaviors. And these are the issues that we attempt to address through behavioral economics, typically with nudges, as I will explain later. By now, we can see that decision-making is really very much part of our day-to-day -day life. Some decisions are more important than the others. Some are difficult while others are easy. Apart from the actual decisions that we make, the more important question is, as we make all these decisions from the easy decision to the tough ones, how do we know that we are making the right decision? Is it leading to the desired outcome? Are we better off? How do we know that we are making decisions 
rationally. Is there anything that we can do better before making any decision? Obviously, we would want to make the right decisions, especially for all the important decisions so that we can be happy and lead a successful life for our own well-being and according to our own definition, which can vary from one person to another. However, we know that humans have decision-making limitations. Despite the notion of homo economicus in neoclassical economics, which refers to humans as rational and full of self-interest and who pursue their well-being to the fullest in all transactions. As much as we would want to be a rational agent who is able to compute the best decisions for all the important decisions in our life, as humans, we are limited by our cognitive biases. Cognitive bias is a systematic error in thinking. The term introduced in 70s by psychologist Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman is used to describe people's systematic flawed patterns of responses to judgment and decision problems. As a result of this bias, humans' decision making is flawed. Not that our decision making is flawed all the time, and that is something I hope to deliberate further as I move along in this talk. Numerous types of cognitive biases have been identified. I will not dwell into the various types of biases in this talk. For one, the discussion on different biases will likely take much longer than this talk permits. And secondly, the discussion might bore some, if not most of you. But if you are interested, there are many references available. Or if you prefer, you can also get in touch with me. Not that I am an expert, but hopefully I can guide you to where you can find suitable references on the subject. Now that we've talked about cognitive bias, let's move to a related topic. And that is to do with the way we think and how is that important to our decision-making process. Let's discuss about the operating systems of our brain. Based on the work by Nobel laureate uh, Daniel Kahneman, our brain has two operating systems. The first is called system one and the second system two. System one is fast thinking, whereas system two is slow thinking. System one is automatic and system two is deliberative. Let's examine a little bit more about these systems. System one uses shortcuts or heuristics to make decisions. System one thinking is effortless, uh, associative and intuitive. On the other hand, system two is deliberative, considers a broad range of factors, effortful based on reasoning and reflective. We have a tendency to make decision based on system one. It is argued that this is where the problem lies. The fact that we rely on this automatic system one thinking. Due to this tendency, instead of being a rational decision maker of homo economicus, we are irrational, especially for decisions under risk and uncertainty. Instead of making decisions based on deliberation, we use shortcuts, which are easy and automatic. Now, what can we do recognizing our decision-making limitations? First, use nudge to encourage a desired behavior in order to achieve your life's goals based on the understanding of human cognitive limitations. The term nudge was made popular by behavioral economist Richard Thaler and law professor Cass Sustin through their book Nudge, which was published in 2009. The cover of the book shows a mother elephant using her trunk uh, to direct her calf in a forward direction. The act of the mother elephant in encouraging her calf to move forward using her trunk is a very useful way to describe what Nudge is. Nudge is the most common approach in behavioral economics to address behavioral gaps of citizens and is defined as any aspect of the choice architecture that alter people's behavior in a, in a predictable way without forbidding any options or significantly changing their economic incentives. An example of nudge is to place fresh fruits at attractive locations in the canteen or cafeteria and rearrange other less nutritious foods with a goal to encourage students to eat healthy food. 
as students enter the canteen, they see that fruits are visibly positioned at attractive places, easy, easily accessible locations, and at eye level, perhaps. With this arrangement, students will be attracted uh, to the fruit and hopefully decide to buy fruits instead of less healthy alternat alternatives. By doing this nudge, more students eat healthily and this contributes towards their overall well-being. The people who design and determine how to arrange various foods in the canteen is called choice architect. Choice architect can be anyone who designs the nudges. It can be a school or university administrator for the example I've just given. For the society, nudge is implemented by the government, be it at local, state, or federal level. One of the most common approaches in Nudge is default. When we buy a new smartphone, for example, it comes with a default factory settings because default settings are automatic, easy, do not require any effort. Most people would just stick to the default settings. Default encourage users to adopt certain behavior as people are more likely to stick to the default choice. If you are a policymaker, and if you want people to adopt behavior A, for example, then you set behavior A as the default. If the government wants people to be organ donors, for example, government can set the default where everyone is an organ donor unless they opt out. Up to this point, I've explained about human's tendency to use system one thinking that leads to bad decisions and the application of nudge to overcome humans' biases in decision making. Having said that, heuristic or shortcut that is associated with system one thinking is very useful for our practical day-to-day -day life as it allows us to make quick judgment calls. Heuristics are efficient uh, as it uses less mental energy and thus allowing us to allocate our mental resources to more important matters. Going back to Nudge, as explained earlier, Nudge is implemented by an external party, typically the government. Uh, for example, nudges or behavioral interventions are adopted to encourage citizens to submit their income tax form early or to improve retirement savings among workers. Let us now see if there's anything we can do as individuals. Enter self nudges. Self nudges are approaches based on behavioral science to manage a humans' self control problems, as I stated early, earlier in the talk. Self nudges are empowering interventions that enable people to design and structure their own decision environments. In self nudges, individuals become their own choice architect. To be our own choice architect, we must be aware of the link between our behavior and the architecture of the environment. If you want to spend less on credit card, for example, would it work if we just leave our card at home whenever we go out for shopping? In short, to be able to practice, to practice self-nudging, we should have knowledge that can help to break or modify the link between our behavior and the environment. As I end this talk, I believe I have given you sufficient exposure on the topic of decision making and nudge. I hope the topic of this talk will generate interest that some of you will delve into in the future. And with that, I thank you for your attention.